when the division was first formed during World War II, the method was jumping out of airplanes into Nazi Europe. The 101st Airborne, which was to play such a legendary role in World War II, did not even exist when the war began. Many top brass in the Army were skeptical about whether parachute troops would be of much use. But that quickly changed when Hitler's Germans used paratroopers to great effect in overrunning Europe. Soon, the U.S. Army had two of its own airborne divisions, the 82nd and the 101st. The 101 was earmarked for history on its very first day of existence in August 1942. Its commander, General Bill Lee, told the men in his opening speech, the 101st has no history, but it has a rendezvous with destiny. For its symbol, the division looked back to the Civil War and to the famous Iron Brigade from Wisconsin, who always carried an eagle old Abe into battle, even after Abe was wounded the 101 would call themselves the Screaming Eagles. From the start, training was brutally tough. The Army wanted to find men who could fend for themselves after being dropped from an airplane behind enemy lines. Only one man in three survived the training regimen, which included a forced march of 140 miles in three days. They also, at one point, went to a slaughterhouse and got truckloads of hog entrails and dumped on the ground, spread them out, and then we had to crawl through those with live machine gun fire 18 inches over the ground. We were absolutely physically fit. I don't think there's a man in there that wouldn't have taken on a gorilla if they put him out there with him. The story at that time was that the way they ascertained that you were fit to be a parachutist was to put one doctor on each side of you looking in your ears. If they could see each other, you were in. The Screaming Eagles were all volunteers. They joined to fight alongside the best, they said, and for the parachute pay, a bonus of $50 a month and 100 for officers. Of course, I didn't realize at that time, and I did realize later, that $100 a month jump pay was blood money. I'll find that out later. The paratroopers had to learn jumping until finally they were good enough to make five jumps from real planes, which earned them their silver wings. Boy, when you got that fifth jump in and, and they pinned your wings on, you just felt like you could fly without wings. It was a most uh, wonderful feeling. By September 1943, the Screaming Eagles were in England, preparing for the Allied invasion of Europe. As an untried experimental unit, the 101 came under close scrutiny from wartime leaders, including the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Allied commander, General Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower was secretly anxious about the safety of the paratroopers. Some Allied generals were predicting 80% casualties in a drop against the Germans. Even a demonstration jump for the top brass proved dangerous. They finally jumped us. We had one guy kill, Sergeant Sarver. And uh, about 10% uh, of the guys ended up in the hospital. And that was pretty sobering, but that was par for the course. By June of 1944, the Screaming Eagles knew exactly what their mission would be. The Allies were planning a mass invasion of Europe to begin the task of pushing back Hitler's armies. The invasion would begin on the French coast in Normandy, and the Screaming Eagles would be among the first to go in. Under the plan, the bulk of the invasion force would arrive by ship along the Cherbourg Peninsula at the beaches codenamed Omaha and Utah. The airborne divisions would parachute in before them, to take the German-held area behind the beaches so that the seaborne forces could move inland. It was a highly dangerous mission, and no one knew what to expect. 
The invasion date, D-Day, was set for June 6th. On the night of the 5th, nearly 6,700 Screaming Eagles checked their parachutes and prepared to board their planes. They were given a special dinner, a condemned man's last meal, one soldier called it, before heading out. I remember they fed us uh, pork chops and fried chicken, which was a real treat. As a matter of fact, we were eating chicken legs on the way uh, up to our uh, assigned uh, C-47 troop ship. The new division commander, General Maxwell Taylor, who'd replaced the ailing Bill Lee, promised the men, give me three days of hard fighting and you will be relieved. Eisenhower himself came down to the airfield. He didn't give a speech, but spoke one by one to hundreds of the men, wishing them luck. Then he stayed to watch as the paratroopers boarded their planes for what would be their first ever combat mission. Soon the world would know whether America's experiment with airborne troops would work or not. As Eisenhower gave a silent salute, the planes took off toward Hitler's Fortress Europe. Most of us were thinking about, are we really gonna be okay? You know, or we, we think we're brave and all that sort of thing, but what are we really gonna do when we know we're being shot at and that bullet's intended for us? And you know, some very long thoughts going on. You start to do a little praying and uh, you pray very sincerely because you're going into the unknown and you wanna know, you doubt yourself, you're not sure in your own heart whether you can handle us. Below them, in the English Channel, were 6,000 Allied vessels heading for Normandy. It was the most fantastic scene that I've ever seen in my life. There was hardly a piece of water going over the coast that wasn't covered with a ship of some kind. And I looked down there and I thought, those guys are waiting for us. And if we don't make a successful landing, this is a failed operation. As they crossed the coastline, some of the pilots yelled, say hello to France, boys, and they got ready to jump. The mission had been very precisely planned, and it was about to go completely wrong. On D-Day of the European invasion, all went according to plan for the 101st Airborne until their transport planes crossed into France. Then German anti-aircraft fire started coming up and many pilots panicked, disobeyed orders and broke formation. When we hit the coast of Normandy, it all hell broke loose. The, the firing on the plane was, I mean, there was so much aircraft and ground fire that the, uh, Pilots start taking evasive action immediately. Instead of jumping from 700 feet at 100 miles an hour, many of the Screaming Eagle paratroopers had to jump from only 300 feet, from planes going 200 miles an hour. Opening shock was that strong when you're doing about 200 miles an hour that the uh, rope tore and there went all your equipment, and so you lost everything. They lost their rifles. They lost their sidearms. Uh, they pretty well came down with just maybe a grenade or two attached to their, uh, to their uh, rings up there, and maybe a knife uh, attached to their boot. The carefully planned jump turned into chaos, with the men scattered all over Normandy. Many were dropped as far as 10 miles from their planned landing zones. Some were dropped into the English Channel and drowned and others came down directly on top of German troops and were killed before they hit the ground. I believe we lost close to 1,000 men, and so did the 82nd on uh, these men who never got back to their own units because they were dropped so far apart and so far from their designated drop zones. Many found themselves alone at night in enemy-held territory with little idea where they were. I had a Tommy gun, a Thompson submachine gun, and I was on my stomach on the ground, and I 
let it burst when I saw some feet coming my way and no recognition signal. I gave a burst and that poor cow was killed. Barney Ryan and his colleagues were dropped into a neck deep swamp surrounded by Germans and had to swim for their lives. <laughs> so we all dropped back on our backs in the water, started paddling back and we got separated. I never saw them again. And I tried to get out of that swamp three times during the night. Every time I made some noise, it would be fired on. So I was right in the middle of a group of Germans. He spent three days surrounded by Germans until American troops arrived and took the area. The Eagles had been trained to be resourceful behind enemy lines, and now it was paying off. Paratroopers, by and large, felt they could be a one-man army. If, if they fell or jumped and were by themselves, they'd, they'd do what they could to fight their way back or, or get back to their unit. To identify each other in the dark, the paratroopers were given children's toys, crickets. The idea was that you challenged with one click and you responded with two clicks. Now, why that was a good idea was that if you use words, it's very difficult to disseminate that, get it out to, to every man so that he knows it. It's hard for him to remember it. Some of them are going to forget it under the stress of combat and so forth. But having crickets was no guarantee of knowing who was around the next hedgerow. And I bumped into a body. And I spun around, and there was a little old Frenchman in the he was hiding there in the hedgerow, and I had my rifle right between his eyes, and he was chattering away, and I'm, I'm sure he was telling me he's not an enemy. In case of capture, officers were given escape equipment, including a map of France, a saw, and a compass. I took this map, folded it up, and sewed it in the lining of my trousers. And for the saw, I took the uh, saw and I split the sole of my boot and put the saw between the soles of my boot. And for the uh, compass, I put that in the fly of my pants. Because of the scattered drop, soldiers had to create makeshift units as they went along. By the end of the first day, only one soldier in three had found his own unit. But the scattering had unexpected payoffs. Although it confused the American paratroopers, it confused the Germans even more. Because it was so screwed up. It was so screwed up, the Germans didn't really know what the major mission was. They didn't know where to rush their main forces because they were, we had men all over the whole peninsula. You couldn't have planned reconnaissance better in a way, although you wouldn't have done it, uh, than to <laughs> have these chaps drop where they were and uh, come back and, and tell us who they'd seen and where they had been and what they had done. Because of the scattering, there were no defined front lines on the peninsula. So the initial fighting became a series of small unit actions. A lot of it was combat in cities type of fighting, where they were in a group of houses. And in that case, you just had to fire a bazooka into the house, uh, mortar if you had mortar or whatever. So the, the, the kind of fighting was a function of where the enemy was and where you found him. This kind of fighting played to the Eagle's advantage. We were trained to take care of guerrilla type fighting and small unit fighting. Uh, that had been our basically our training. For the Germans, I don't. They were not trained as intensely as we were for this type of fighting. For Richard Winters on D-Day, the main mission was to lead a dozen men in a raid to take out four huge German artillery guns that were pounding the Americans on Utah Beach, three miles away. I charged with the rest of the guys. And uh, we took the first trench. We captured the first 
gun. The tactic for something like that, if you're on their flank, you put down another base of fire on the next gun and charge that. Very basic, very simple, nothing unusual about it. We had done this sort of thing in training, but we did this four times, and we took all four guns. The effect was pivotal. The action virtually stopped the shelling of American forces coming ashore on Utah Beach. It was only afterwards that we realized what we had done. At the time, we didn't realize that this was a key operation. It was just a, a job that had to be done. At the end of the first day's fighting, division reinforcements began arriving by glider, bringing in men and anti-tank guns. But many of the gliders crash landed, hitting trees and hedgerows. 19 soldiers were killed. Over the next two days of fighting, the 101 took control of its target areas behind Utah Beach. Now it was ordered to look south to take the town of Carentan, a vital crossroads of highways and railroads. Carentan was the key to controlling the whole peninsula, and the Germans had been ordered to defend it to the last man. Advancing on Carentan made the Eagles sitting ducks because the causeways that led into town sat exposed above the surrounding marshes. It was called Purple Heart Lane by uh, a lot of our troopers, because they got them. They got their Purple Hearts there, if they survived. I was shot in the chest on the right side. I felt something run out of my mouth, I guess it was blood. And a blanket that was around me was blowing off. An arm reached across my chest, retrieved the blanket, and tucked it in all around me very tenderly. And I would manage to move my head to the right, and it was a German PW on the on the on the uh, stretcher next to me. And I didn't say anything to him, and he didn't say anything to me. But our eyes sort of locked, and and uh, that's always kind of stayed with me all these years. The Germans in Carentan threw everything they could at the Screaming Eagles as they approached the town, pounding them with heavy artillery. Colonel Robert Cole, whose men were pinned down by heavy fire on the edge of town, decided to lead a bayonet charge against a farmhouse that contained a nest of German machine guns. One by one, the men got up with him and uh, charged across his field, yelling like a bunch of Comanches. And uh, I guess it, it sort of shook the Germans, and they just uh, either bugged out or gave up or got killed, uh, one of the three. Of course, coming across this field, we were exposed to these men over here in the hedgerows here all the time, and they had us perfectly covered. So it was simply a matter of getting across the open ground as quickly as possible. Colonel Cole's charge won him the Medal of Honor, we but he never got to see it. Three months later, as he scouted a battlefield in Holland, a sniper's bullet killed him. After three days of heavy fighting, the Screaming Eagles took Carentan, but then had to hunker down against a fierce German counterattack from tanks, artillery, and machine guns. While we're in there fighting the Germans, they were in there and we were in there in close combat, we were being bombed. The city was being bombed, it was practically obliterated. And it was a scary thing. We were just holding on with, a, our, with our fingers, uh, just holding on and not, uh, not letting them push us back. The 101st desperately held Carentan against the counterattack for two full days until American artillery and armor arrived from the beach to help drive the Germans out. Then the Eagles and the other American forces linked up to gradually take control of the whole Cherbourg Peninsula. One month after they had landed, and not three days, as promised, the division's work in Normandy was complete. It had paid a heavy price. One in every four soldiers had been killed or wounded. But its first taste of battle had proven a triumph and justified General Eisenhower's faith in paratroopers.
After their success in Normandy, the Screaming Eagles had a few weeks in England to rest and lick their wounds. But they knew it would not be long before they would have to jump again behind Nazi lines in Europe. In September 1944, the division took off for Holland and Operation Market Garden. American, British, and Polish paratroopers were to be dropped behind the German lines in Holland and take control of a highway running north to the Rhine River so that British tanks could sweep north and into Germany. As in Normandy, the Airborne's role was to lay out a carpet for the Allied forces coming in behind them. But the jump into Holland was very different from the one into Normandy. It was done in daylight, and it was done with precision. And this time, gliders played a much bigger part. More than 600 of them landed in Holland, bringing in nearly half the division. Landings could still be rough, but the flights brought in valuable men, jeeps, trailers, and howitzers. The 101's mission was to secure the area around the southern end of the highway, and within two days, it did so. The Germans at first had been caught off guard. The Eagles captured several Dutch towns and the southern section of the highway. They also captured the spoils of war. Several of my people had to crawl into the tank to see if they could loot something out of the tank, which was the normal thing for a GI to do. One of them got a hold of this, this uh, flag this, with a swastika on it. This flag that I'm holding up here came out of that tank. As they liberated towns in their area, the American paratroopers were given an ecstatic welcome from the Dutch, who'd been under Nazi occupation for five years. When the 101st entered the town of Eindhoven, they were swamped by grateful civilians. They wanted to talk, and the girls wanted to kiss the men. Well, naturally, they're not going to walk away from getting a kiss, and uh, food, and drink, and... They thought this was a party. Well, this isn't a party. This is a mission. We got to control these bridges. We got to secure these bridges. But uh, they uh, they got in your road. The American soldiers could not get the residents off the streets, but the Germans could. The Germans moved a Tiger tank up on the other side of the canal and started firing and. Uh, it wasn't long before you couldn't see any Dutch people anyplace. <laughs> they had disappeared indoors. The Germans might have been surprised initially, but now the 101st knew they were in for a brutal struggle to keep open the 16 miles of highway under their watch. All told, the Allied paratroopers had to keep open 60 miles of road, and that became increasingly difficult as the Germans regrouped and pounded them with artillery. The soldiers soon renamed their stretch of road, Hell's Highway. It's the most frightening thing in the world because you can't go any place. You got to just stay there and take it. And you see guys being blown up all around you. And uh, if one hits close to you, it'll, it'll actually lift you off the ground. In one trench, Private Joe Mann sat with his arms bound up and useless after being wounded four times. Then he watched helplessly as a German grenade landed among him and six comrades. Both his arms were in bandages, but he dove on it, yelled grenade, and uh, laid up right on his back. He flopped right on, on the grenade and took the full blast uh, from that grenade, and of course it killed him. For his self-sacrifice, Private Joe Mann was awarded the Medal of Honor. For the Holland operation to work, the key element was speed. It was vital that the British tanks come up quickly from the south, but that didn't happen. They were delayed by heavy German fire and didn't link up with the Americans till late on the second day. Many of the Screaming Eagles felt the British had no sense of urgency. Richard Winters tracked down one British tank commander who'd left his tanks to socialize with the locals. My God, 
here sits this British soldier and a beautiful Dutch girl in front of the fireplace having a nice plate of eggs. Well, he's embarrassed. The Dutch girl is very pleasant. She turns and smiles. The English soldier, officer, uh, turns and says to me, are my tanks still outside? Gee, Merry Christmas. That's how interested he was. That's the kind of guy I'm working with. Are my tanks still outside on a roadblock? You're surrounded? I lost my temper. With the tank movement delayed, the British paratroopers, who jumped near the northern end of the highway near Arnhem, became easy prey for German tanks and artillery. In what became famous as the story of a bridge too far, 10,000 British paratroopers jumped north of the Rhine River, and only one quarter of them made it back. Farther south, the battle for Hell's Highway began to bog down, and the Allies gradually realized that Operation Market Garden was not going to work. The Germans retreated from Hell's Highway, but they consolidated around Arnhem, blocking the Allied plans to break through into Germany. Everyone said, the British took too much time coming up that highway. I, I have felt that had that been George Patton, coming up that highway, he'd have made it. The 101st now hoped they would be relieved, but instead, they were sent to the front line, below the Rhine near Arnhem. It was a static front, and the Eagles spent much of their time sitting in foxholes, a target once again for German artillery. We were on the lower, low ground, and Arnhem was on the high ground, and uh, they could see every movement we made, so we didn't move around much in the daytime because they'd uh, put artillery fire on us. The shelling, punctuated by fierce infantry fighting, dragged on for weeks, with neither side gaining any real ground. The Eagles had been told that the Holland campaign would be a 72-hour operation. By the time they left, they had been there for 72 days. Being mortared in artillery fire, we lost our regimental commander. He got killed by mortar and lost a lot of good people and so forth. Now, that's just uh, a very poor use of, of airborne troops. Finally, the division was pulled off the front line and sent for a much needed rest to a camp in Mormelon in France's Champagne province. Christmas was coming and there were leave passes to Paris and the talk of the camp was the interdivisional football game, the Champagne Bowl, to be played on Christmas Day, followed by turkey dinner and champagne. But neither the game nor the dinner was ever held. Adolf Hitler had other plans. On December 17th, word came down that the Germans had launched a huge offensive to the north in Belgium. They'd pushed the Allied front line back 65 miles, creating a bulge that would give its name to the ensuing battle. Allied commanders, taken completely by surprise, ordered all available troops to rush there to stem the tide. About four o'clock in the morning, we were awakened and told that uh, we were gonna go on an operation. And I told the guys, well, they're full of shit. They're no, we can't go, we don't have any uniforms. We, most of us have turned in our weapons. We don't have any ammunition. They're, they're full of crap. Well, found out they weren't. 12,000 screaming eagles were loaded into trucks and driven north at high speed. Some did not even have time to collect their winter clothes or boots. The 101 was ordered to go to the town of Bastogne, where many of Belgium's major highways intersected. Hitler had declared it must be taken, and General Eisenhower had ordered that it must be held at all costs dropped us off and we started walking in and we came past this little sign that said Bastonia. I didn't know where in hell that was. I didn't even know what country it was in. But I remember saying to one of the guys, take a good look at that sign. We're gonna make history here. When the Screaming Eagles arrived in Bastogne to halt the German advance, 
they met Allied soldiers running the other way, fleeing the German surge and yelling, they'll kill you all. Bastogne is, is chaotic, there, really. There were so many Jeeps rushing to the rear, <laughs> it was, and they couldn't get out fast enough. The, the car headquarters was moving out as fast as they could. The 101st got to Bastogne just ahead of the onrushing Germans. Now the problem was how to keep them out. The division units pushed outwards from the town to meet the Germans head on and stop them from getting into Bastogne itself. They did meet the Germans. They did stop the Germans. The Germans were really unprepared to have somebody coming at them. They'd been having people on the run ever since they started this thing on the 16th. The division formed a perimeter around Bastogne and held it in the face of tremendous German fire. Al Hassensall was on the front line when his close friend, Punchy Zetwich, was hit in the chest. I said, Punchy, you're going to be all right. And he was hit. He was hit in just about the same place, as far as I could determine, as I was in Normandy. And Punchy said, no, Lieutenant, he said, I don't think so. And he was, his face got that same pallor to it that you know uh, when a guy is hit hard. And anyway, uh, Punchy died in the half track on the way back to the uh, uh, collecting company, a division collecting company. And in 1994, uh, when I, we visited the, at Il Chapelle, the graves of our, our people, I found Punchy. <clears throat> we talked. The division perimeter around Bastogne held against the odds. But within two days, the superior German forces had completely surrounded the town and cut off all roads. The Screaming Eagles were now totally isolated, the hole in the donut, as one of them put it. They were sitting targets for German artillery. You were peppered with uh, anything from screaming memes to mortars to artillery fire. And once in a while, of course, if in your sector they put on attack, you were under small arms fire. Incoming fire was not the only problem. Men on the perimeter were living in foxholes without their winter gear in sub-zero temperatures. We dig foxholes in the snow and hack it out as best we could, two men to a hole to try and keep a little warmer. You just lay down on the ground and sleep, wrap up in your raincoat and sleep. Well, I know people say you can't do that, but I'm telling you, you can. Allied supply planes could not reach Bastogne because of the weather leaving the troops short of food, fuel, and medical supplies. The division's medical situation was desperate. They captured our entire division hospital, which we had thought was in a safe place, but they captured our surgeon, the, all the doctors, all the medical supplies and everything. Medics had to dig their own hospital. We were at foxholes just the same as everybody else in Bastogne. And, uh... We had a uh, we had we had to dig a hole in the ground for our aid station. We dug a hole in the ground about five feet by eight feet by four feet deep, and that was our aid station. Those guys are heroes because they went above and beyond what I would consider the call of duty. They did whatever they could for those guys, but there's very little you can do. Many of them just died of shock or, or froze to death. Yet, despite all the hardships, the Screaming Eagles remained confident. The Germans, with all their advantages, were unable to break the perimeter. We didn't think that uh, uh, the Krauss had the upper hand. We, uh, uh, somebody said, uh, the poor bastards, they, they had us surrounded. <laughs> the Eagles might have been surrounded, but surrender was out of the question, as the Germans were about to find out. By the fifth day of the siege of Bastogne, December 22nd, the Germans assumed the Americans had had enough. They sent two officers into Bastogne with a letter from the German commander, strongly suggesting that the division give up. 
We read the, the message and it demanded that we surrender and if we didn't, a lot of bad things were gonna happen to the 101. We went into General McAuliffe. He at first thought that this was Germans wanting to surrender to us and we disabused him of that very quickly and said, no, they're demanding our surrender. To which uh, General McAuliffe said, us surrender? Oh, nuts. I mean, he thought, you know, we're giving him a shellacking. Why should we surrender? So he just said, oh, nuts. And then General McAuliffe said, well, I don't know what to tell him. And being a smart alley colonel, I piped up and said, well, what you first said would be hard to beat. He said, what do you mean? I said, you said nuts. And uh, everybody nodded his head up and down and thought that was a good idea. So he, he uh, wrote to the German commander, nuts, exclamation, AC, uh, commanding general, 101st, gave it to Bud Harper. Bud Harper took it back to where the Germans were still blindfolded in a company headquarters. He said to the German, I have the answer, I'll put it in your hand. And the German said, is it affirmative or negative? He said, it's decidedly negative, it's nuts. And the guy said, nice, nice, was ist das? He couldn't, have, couldn't comprehend what this could be. And, and uh, Bud Harper said, well, in plain English, it means go to hell. McAuliffe's reply was cheered by the men who felt exactly the same way about the notion of surrender. That subject never came up. We never talked about it. We never thought about it. It was never considered. We had confidence in ourselves, and this is no exaggeration. We had confidence in ourselves. We had no, there was no thought of being overrun. Besides, I knew if I surrendered, when I got in a German prisoner war camp, all they're gonna feed me is turnip soup, and I hate turnips. The Germans resumed their attack on the Bastogne perimeter, but they made a fatal tactical error. They attacked only one section at a time, and each time they were met by the full force of the American artillery inside, which included artillery units that stayed behind in Bastogne with the 101. It made the Germans think the American arsenal was much stronger than it was. We had interior lines, you see, and could move quickly, and, and the massing of artillery was very, very important to be able to shift those fires to wherever we were threatened. We would have been in deep doo-doo had we had the Germans attacked simultaneously all the way around the perimeter, but they chose to hit certain areas. The Germans fired more than shells. Their guns also sent in fake Christmas cards, again urging the Americans to surrender. But just before Christmas, there was a break in the weather, and Allied bombers flew over and pounded German positions, taking some of the heat off Bastogne. Even more welcome were the resupply planes. They brought in much needed ammunition, but still left the 101 with some serious shortages. Gasoline and medical supplies were at a low ebb, and there was still not nearly enough rations to make Christmas dinner a merry one. The feast was crackers and sardines for the officers and bean soup for those in the foxholes. It was on December 26th that the Screaming Eagles finally got their belated Christmas present. The 4th Armored Division from General Patton's army broke through the German position south of Bastogne and reached the 101st. The siege was finally over. I'll tell you, those, those guys who were up in the front lines were really spooked out. And uh, when the tanks actually came right up to their positions, uh, that tank commander had to call out to them, hey, we're, we're, uh, we're friendlies. With the siege over, the men could finally get food and medical supplies, and also mail, although that could be a mixed blessing. I was sitting on a log in the snow, snow up to my ass, and I got a letter from the Internal Revenue Service. It said I owed them $128, and if I didn't pay it, they'd put me in jail. So I took a bunch of money from Belgian and French money that I had and put it in an envelope and wrote a letter and said, if you'll promise me you'll put me in jail, by God, come on and get me. And I never heard a word after that. They didn't know it, but the men of the 101 had become world famous as the battered bastards of Bastogne. 
and even Hitler told his commanders he'd like to see a German general who'd fight with such resistance when the situation appeared hopeless. But Hitler himself had not given up. The siege was over, but the battle for Bastogne and the rest of the bulge went on. The Screaming Eagles joined the American First and Third Armies in the fight to push the Germans back. By mid-January of 1945, the American armies had driven the Germans back towards their own border. The Battle of the Bulge was over. In Bastogne, the American 7th Corps commander, General Middleton, called the 101 the finest division he'd ever known. But before handing the town over to General Middleton, the Eagles made him sign a receipt which said, received from the 101st Airborne, the town of Bastogne, Belgium. Condition, used but serviceable. Kraut disinfected. After some border patrol duty in Alsace, the division returned to camp in France, where General Eisenhower created a precedent by awarding the entire division the Distinguished Unit Citation. You met every test, he told them, and I am awfully proud of you. In April 1945, the Screaming Eagles were sent into Germany itself and found that the German army, so recently a feared enemy, was giving itself up en masse. It was kind of scary in a way, because here you got, sometimes it was, there'd be 500 of them and come into one guy and, and want, want to surrender and you just take them in. In Germany, the division unexpectedly came upon evidence of why it had been fighting the Nazis. In the town of Landsberg, the 101 entered a concentration camp that had been liberated the day before by the 10th Armored Division. Soldiers who were used to almost everything were literally sick and vomiting and whatnot at the, at the corpses and the stench and everything going on. The division ordered the town's German civilians to grab shovels and help bury the dead. One kid, maybe not 15 year old, gave the Heil Hitler salute, and one of my sergeants booted his butt right into the open pit with all the, uh, the bodies. The division's target was the Alpine village of Berchtesgaden, where Hitler kept his fortified retreat, the Eagle's Nest. By the time the 101 reached Berchtesgaden, there was little resistance. Hitler was dead in Berlin, and the official German surrender was only a day away. The soldiers were free to enter Hitler's villa. The Eagle's Nest was now the domain of the Screaming Eagles. Walking into the Eagle's Nest it was like walking into a wonderful set that Hollywood might conceive. I mean, if there was anything that you could wish for on a, on a from a view to the house itself to, to being one of a kind, totally unique, uh, it was the Eagle's Nest. My own feeling was it was much too good for him. This is what you've been fighting for. You've, you've reached it. This is your goal. This is victory. It's the end of the war. Walking into a bunker, and it was near his quarters, and seeing the lights on, on the switchboard. That has left an impression. Uh, you know, you're hot on the trail when the lights on the switchboard, the headquarters are still on. The victorious troops souvenired everything that wasn't nailed down and made successful raids on Hitler's wine cellar, which came in very handy on Armistice Day. Hitler's armored staff cars were requisitioned as Jeeps and soldiers used their machine guns to prove that they weren't totally bulletproof. The nearby villas of other Nazi big shots were also looted. From the closets of Hitler's deputy, Hermann Goering, came comprehensive trophies of underwear. Boxer shorts weren't Goering's only collectibles. The 101 oversaw the recovery of precious art treasures looted for Goering by German troops across Europe. The stash included works by Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and Renoir. Soldiers also discovered famous Nazis hiding in the surrounding mountains. 
Among those arrested were Julius Stryker, the notorious anti-Semite propagandist, and Dr. Robert Lay, leader of the Nazi labor front. Officers, especially the officers that had Jewish background, and they knew what had happened to their people, uh, uh, they really hunted them down. During the summer of 45, the Screaming Eagles returned to camp in France to await a possible jump into Japan, although the Hiroshima bomb ended that possibility. With no missions left to make, the war was over for the division, and it was deactivated. The 101st Airborne no longer existed, officially anyway. It was already a permanent part of those who had served. The 101, unquestionably, was as fine a division as the Army's ever fielded in any war. And to be a, a part of it uh, and engage a real live enemy in that unit was wonderful. Uh, war is, is hell, but if you've got to be in war, you want to be with a unit like the 101. I still love those guys. And when you are in an outfit like that and live and fight as we did, you're as close or closer than you are to your own wife. You're stripped of all pretense. I get, I get choked up. Wonderful bunch of guys. Looking at pictures of the men, I think of looking at men that are satisfied. They're satisfied within themselves. He's not swaggering. To swagger is to become a hero. No, these fellows aren't swaggering. They're satisfied. The Screaming Eagles had seen only one year of action, but what a year it had been. And they had written their names into history 